Okay. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final uh, meeting session of the Research Synergies meeting where we will be discussing social sciences today. Um, we have just come off of three really great sessions on transmission yesterday and vaccines and uh, therapeutics last week with a lot of great discussions. Today we will be looking at a very ambitious program of social sciences in four parallel uh, streams that, uh, that uh, our coordinators, uh, Joao and Morgan have put together. So thanks for that. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite my co-chair, uh, Dr. Yazdin Yazdin Pana to take uh, to give a few words about uh, what we are going to be doing today and a little bit about uh, Glopedar uh, as we go out into breakout sessions and the co-chairs will talk about those. Go ahead, Yazdin. Thanks, Charu, and uh, uh, good um, afternoon for European people, African people. Good morning for America, and good. Uh, night probably for people from Asia. So it's a pleasure for me to be here and thanks uh, a lot for being uh, with us this uh, afternoon. Next slide. I wanted, as Charles said, first to say a few words regarding GLOPIDAR, which is the Global Research Collaboration for Infectious Diseases uh, Preparedness, uh, which is an international network of research funding organizations, and that is extremely important that was launched in 2013 to facilitate, accelerate, and deepen collaboration among research funders on emerging infectious diseases. Uh, its objectives are to invest to strengthen global research preparedness between crises and to mobilize resources to respond rapidly and effectively to significant, significant infectious disease outbreaks uh, during the crisis. Next slide. This slide actually uh, shows the number of members, 29 members are around the world. And we have also uh, two observers next, uh, among which of course WHO. Next slide. Uh, uh, this slide resumes, summarize the response of Global Cup to the COVID pandemic. Uh, where members, observers, and stakeholders of Global R were mobilized in the response to collect, collect information from members on existing research activities in the first beginning of the disease, to try to set up priorities, to set up a roadmap, and that was done, of course, in close collaboration with WHO Blueprint, and to remind you in particular the meeting we had uh, at, in February in Geneva. Uh, funders launch emergency calls, European Commission, uh, UK Medical Research Primary Government Funders, CEPI, BMGA, Government of Canada, or welcome the FID. And what we really tried our best to do with some success, but we should be improved, is to coordinate funders to optimize resources, to avoid duplication, and to cover priorities that are listed uh, in the roadmap. Uh, in the beginning, in February, we discussed that it will be good after the researchers have started working to try to gather them by July, by June, and to ask those researchers who have been funded uh, what are still the gaps now that we are six months after the beginning of the epidemic? And in particular, the social sciences. We believe is extremely important topic and in particular in the future months. So thanks again for being here. Thanks again to those who are organized this session. Uh, and I give back the floor to Charo uh, for uh, uh, the presentation of the afternoon. Thanks, Charu. Uh, thank you, Yazdin. So we're trying to figure out this technology, so bear with us. Uh, and uh, the chairs will be giving you some housekeeping instructions as well. Uh, in the meantime, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our two co-chairs for today. 
uh, Christy Cooks uh, and uh, Kenneth Margo. Uh, Christy is uh, a program manager uh, with the Population Health Unit for Hunter New England Population Health in the Australian Partnership for Preparedness Research on Infectious Disease uh, Emergencies. She's a proud Aboriginal woman who has a focus on uh, uh, research focus on uh, uh, developing a process on how to uh, privilege Aboriginal voices in infectious disease emergency and planning program. Uh, and Kenneth Camargo is a full professor in the Rio de Janeiro Un uh, State University. Uh, he's a physician and has spent a couple, a couple of decades teaching and running research at the hospital uh, as well as at the University of Rio de Janeiro. So I'm going to hand it over to Christy and Kenneth to walk us through how the breakout sessions will work. And I'm looking forward to the discussions today. Thanks, Charu and Yasdin. Yama, my name is Christy Crooks. I'm a Yaralaya woman um, from a small community in New South Wales, Australia. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands and the seas on which I live and work and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And as I sit on the lands of the Awabakal people, I must recognise that this land is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. On behalf of my co-chair and I, um, I would like to thank and welcome you to the fourth and final session of the Glopadar meeting. Uh, today's meeting is focusing on the social sciences research on COVID and we're going to hear from a wide range of speakers which I know will generate for some uh, fruitful discussion. I'd also like to thank the Glopadar chairs, Jarrah and Yazdan, and also like to acknowledge Jarrah and uh, Morgan and the team for putting together a wonderful and very thought out program. I know a lot of work and effort's been put into organising this, especially with the challenges of the technology. Again, well done and thank you. Um, as Charu mentioned, I'm a PhD scholar funded through the Apprise Network in Australia, and my research focuses on developing a way of um, privileging First Nation Australian voices in public health emergencies. So I was getting deep into data analysis before COVID hit, um, and then had to be deployed to doing some local response for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. As I said before, uh, we're going to hear some presentations from some fabulous speakers across four themes. Um, the population health experience, communications and engagement, governance and methodologies. And our aims for this meeting is to provide some um, overview of the projects that is happening in relation to COVID, facilitate collaborations among researchers around the world, formulate specific questions to the funders to maximise the impact of the platform and investigate particular issues and planning agendas for the future, as well as generating connections and networks between ongoing research projects and connect with policy makers. I am honoured to be chairing today's session with um, Dr. Kenneth Camargo and I'll hand over to Kenneth to introduce himself and briefly share his um, perspective on the social sciences landscape. Thanks, Kenneth. You're on mute. I, okay, I just unmuted. Uh, thanks, Chrissy. Um, good morning or evening or afternoon for everyone. Uh, I, I would like to thank everyone to be present to this meeting. It's an honor to be co-hosting with Christy. Uh, I would like to thank the efforts that everyone has put into this, particularly João. Um, I have been working with social research and uh, with a number of subjects related to health, particularly HIV and AIDS here in Brazil uh, for a number of years. Uh, and I see some parallels. Uh, we should have learned from the experiences in history, but unfortunately that, that does not seem to be always the case. Uh, I think from uh, the, the greatest contribution that we have to offer is to think about uh, how there is nothing inherent in the vulnerabilities of certain population groups. Uh, those vulnerabilities are socially produced and as such, the social science approach is necessary to understand and devise ways to counteract them. Uh, in that sense, I think that the approach, the, the general approaches from the social sciences are an integral part of the response to the pandemic and not just an afterthought of something that we've done while we don't have a vaccine or, or effective treatment, something like that. Uh, the experience with dealing with HIV and AIDS on a global scale has shown us that anthropology, social science, political science have been 
uh, have played a, a major role in identifying the problems and, and proposing solutions. I think that we should in particular think about how the, uh, how the effects that, that this pandemic is having, particularly from the social and economic point of view, and how to allow people to protect themselves in an environment uh, when they do not have access to proper housing, food, or even jobs. And the other uh, highlight that uh, I would like to make is to think about the synergies, uh, how all the, the different research groups can interact with each other in order to maximize the use of resources and also the possible repercussions of our research. Uh, just a, a reminder, uh, we'll have this uh, four breakout rooms, people will be allocated randomly and only the presenters, the chairs and rapporteurs will have the cameras. Uh, people who are participating in, in those groups, if they want to have uh, to engage in the discussion, they have to raise, use the, the resource to raise the hand and the chair will acknowledge them. Uh, the chairs will be managing the room, one, for, one, one manager for each room. And after 60 minutes, the breakout rooms will close automatically. So everyone will move back to the plenary session we will have presentations by the rapporteurs of the four groups and then a general Q&A before we close. Uh, there will be a five minute break after the, the breakout room so that the rapporteurs and chairs can put together the thoughts and organize the presentations. And I'm looking forward to working with you. Uh, as I said, it's a great honor to be here and I'll yield back to Chrissy. Okay, uh, I think we, should, we could go on to the rapporteurs presentations. I would uh, yield the floor to Bial to Thanks. present the session on, on uh, population experiences, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the first observation that we had is that this time is uh, there's something very unusual uh, happened, which provided a broader context under which we are carrying out the social science research. This context is that most governments in the world seems to be very responsive epidemiologically towards this pandemic. So some governments are doing so even excessively by using military and using all kinds of very heavy handed measures. So therefore, social scientists, we think, can make a very uh, unique contribution, not by asking the government to do more, but to do it more wisely. Huh? The question is not about more or less actions, but it's about how. So then, in, under this context, the number one question that we raise is that we have observed is that uh, what is neglected under this kind of very single minded uh, reaction toward the pandemic is that uh, people's health needs are often multifaceted. Yeah. And uh, we, we observe in many countries the prioritization of uh, COVID actually have led to uh, negligence towards other health needs and the livelihood needs. So therefore, a much more balanced consideration is needed. The second point is that uh, we observe that the population in any country, big or small, actually are hugely differentiated. People have different needs and also people will need to develop a different uh, coping strategies because of their living conditions and uh, 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 position in society are so hugely different. And this part is far from being satisfactory uh, based on what we observe now because the heavy handed reaction is often very single minded, as I said, and without being able to differentiate uh, people as uh, a population. And uh, then looking to the future. Uh, what I think is interesting is that uh, what kind of recovery we are going to face. Uh, all our uh, panelists emphasize that what do we observe, all the problems that we observed during the pandemic actually are nothing unique, uniquely specific to, uh, to the pandemic. All this problem exists before, but is being exacerbated during uh, this acute moment of uh, uh, health crisis. So therefore, one recovery strategy is to look at the long-term future and develop a much better social protection infrastructure, long-term infrastructure. So therefore, we can uh, protect the vulnerable better than before. 
But what do we see in reality, I and mean, this is my personal observation, is that actually many countries are now really aiming at a very quick recovery in economic terms. So therefore, they probably will emphasize more on these precarious so-called flexible employment strategies instead of making investment in long-term infrastructure development. So that is really, uh, I think, probably is a, a question that the social science can make uh, intervention at this moment. So the final point is about also the future of the social science itself. Um, uh, urgent intervention by social scientists Sometimes, I mean, it will work to some extent, but at least uh, my personal view, I suppose uh, our panelists also agree, is the social scientists can make contribution that probably will take a longer uh, horizon of time. So uh, we are not only making quick intervention, but also we have to document people's experiences in this difficult time. And we have to reach out to the communities themselves to communicate. So therefore, our business is not only to provide policy advice to the government. So that will require us to develop new methods, uh, how to carry out research in this you know, very uncertain and ideologically divided times. Uh, then can work with the community and then can speak back to them directly, not necessarily go through a policy making loop. So, um, so therefore, I mean, for funding agencies, I think this is another uh, kind of capacity building, right, consideration. I mean, how we can use this opportunity to reshape social science itself to make it more responsive, more embedded and more locally embedded, yeah, uh, type of um, enterprise of uh, knowledge making and uh, therefore to make the social science have a, a stronger voice in public debate, go beyond technical advice. I think now this problem, this time actually we see too many kind of narrow technical advice which lead to very biased and uh, single-minded uh, government action. Probably that is one of the biggest challenges we face. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that great report. Um, it just highlights, you know, that COVID has highlighted lots of inequities among population groups around the world, and and there's a clear need for um, the communities to have a voice in making decisions around um, around their health. So I might ask Deborah to report back on um, the communications and engagements group. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. As um, Christy has already introduced me, I'm Deborah Nyerenda and I'm from Malawi Liverpool Welcome Trust. So in our, um, in our panel, we had four, four presenters. We had, um, we had, we had Jani, Otwin, Sabina and Rose. And some of the issues that they were supposed to focus on, they were supposed to focus on how COVID-19 has shaped social life in the communities, what challenges they are likely to encounter in their researches, as well as how research funders can maximize the impact of research be beyond offering uh, additional funds. So a wrap up of our discussions, um, we talked about the nature of COVID-19 transmission as being complex and presenting challenges on messaging because there's so much to learn and unlearn as we continue to respond to the crisis. And the other issue that is also affecting uh, response to to, to COVID-19 is the issue of fake news. This has killed a lot of people and we need to pay attention to the communication. So we need to make sure that communication is, is context relevant. We need to pay attention to the context uh, where we are working in because some of the standard preventive measures may not really work in that setting. People may not have the ability to socially distance and apply other um, preventive mechanisms. And we also need to pay attention to how the terminologies that we're using to, to, uh, to prevent the spread of COVID because some of these terminologies may lead to stigma and, and a reporting of, um, of, of, of cases. So we need to have different audiences in mind as we're thinking of how we frame our communication. And this, the COVID-19 crisis as well should help us to better prepare for communication during a crisis and not figure it out in the crisis. So um, 
in terms of um, some of the solutions or, or way forward to, to, to the audience, one of, one of the issues that was stressed by most of the uh, our panelists was the issue about involving communities in the way that we frame our communication messages as well as what interventions uh, people should, should follow. They've also stressed issues around interdisciplinary research. Uh, normally in academia, there is a hierarchy in terms of what data is valued and what not. So the, um, the thinking is that we need to value different kinds of data in, in order for us to respond to COVID-19. There, there were also some, some um, challenges that were reported in terms of like data collection because uh, with the requirement to, to maintain physical distance, it, it's hard to use interviews or conduct focus group discussions. So this is presenting challenges in terms of how you collect qualitative data or how do you observe certain behaviors. And it's also hard to reach some of the hard to reach audiences using uh, virtual platforms. And even it, it, it even makes it hard to compensate them when you interview them using um, virtual platforms. Um, so, um, well, as, uh, as way forward, we talked about uh, issues of interdisciplinary research that I've talked about to allow different kinds of data to be represented. Uh, there was a talk around sustaining funding for non-COVID issues because a lot of attention has focused on COVID issues and other health issues are not being prioritized, which may lead us to other problems. There's also been, a, there was also a discussion on uh, um, supporting national funding mechanisms and national knowledge systems and um, involving communities in, in, in all the interventions. I hope I've, co I've, I've covered everything. Thanks, Deborah. Um, we might move to uh, Asha, um, who's going to report back on the governance group. Hi. I hope you can hear me now. This is Asha George. I have the honor to report back from the group discussions on governance. It was chaired by Kelly Lee, and we had presentations from Jane Duckett, Adam Kamrad Scott, uh, Manya Van Renfield, and Fadi El Jardelli. So it was a rich discussion. It was kicked off by Kelly giving an overview of what is governance and why is it so critical to the social science uh, response, not just the social science response, but really in, in understanding how do we better respond to COVID-19. So she gave a very uh, accessible definition. Um, she talked about how governance is really about the rules and processes um, through which organize, um, society is organized and how it collectively steers itself to certain goals. Um, so it's about the relationships between political leaders, public health technocrats, citizens, and it's about legitimacy and how authority is carried through as these decisions are made. It is inherently about equity also. Um, who is at the table when decisions are made and who is left out? And Fadi complimented this because he was reflecting from the, where he sits in the Middle East that there have been very good responses and some more troubling responses. And really it's not just the COVID-19 crisis, it's not just a public health crisis, it's also a governance emergency as we've laid bare some ways of working that have been very problematic. Um, I wanted to touch base on the type of research that was presented. Uh, Jane started with giving an overview of her uh, work, uh, understanding the Chinese response to COVID-19. She has a team um, out of seven out of 10 of the team members are Chinese and they have been looking at from national to community level, what has been the response. Um, and it was an interesting contrast, actually, to some of the other um, country contexts represented 
Um, there was also, because there's been a, a lot of interest in how understanding the Chinese government response um, and how that has influenced other governments, but also how the community level uh, approach has really based on the Chinese history and the Communist Party influence, and therefore this a pervasive sense of surveillance. And in contrast, in Cape Town, there's been a organic, it's a very divided society, one of the most unequal societies in the world, and yet there's been this organic response from communities at a neighborhood level to respond to the COVID-19 crisis, and as Fadi said in the Middle East, to push it beyond it being a hospital response, to really take in consideration community priorities. And the underlying ethos of both Fadi's comments and Manya's comments in Lebanon and in Cape Town has been thinking about community on the basis of solidarity and trust, and how do we support organic community responses that are informal, the challenges of working with with informal non-hierarchical structures and how that interfaces with a very top-down um, state bureaucracy. Where are there moments where there have been openings and where are there challenges still in where discourse hasn't changed? Um, I want to reflect, I have a minute left. Um, there was also the research from Adam looking at um, with other colleagues on compliance on international health regulations, as well as the role of military and how they've been involved in the response. So looking at actors we don't normally think of as part of a public health response. There was a lot of discussion on methods and um, the sense of like, yes, we're all learning how to do things differently. Uh, we're moving online for um, Jane. There were a lot of policy documents online and people are on social media, she's doing social media analysis, but that also led to a discussion of issues of access. Who is on social media? How is that social media monitored? How does that affect the type of governance research we want to do? Overarchingly, there was the sense that research um, in this area really is about relationships. And although there's a push, there's an opportunity to do things differently. And although for some field work has, has been interrupted, for others who are embedded in their contexts, in their communities, working with long-standing relationships with government officials, they've had long, it's these relationships that enable you to go online especially with government officials who are so busy. How do they prioritize responding to you? Those pre-existing relationships are absolutely critical. And that means funding networks or platforms that have a long history of engagement. And Fadi talked about we need to rethink, we not rethink the silos of how research, communication, dissemination is ordinarily thought of, and think of who's invited to the table how we work, our social scientists at, in policy circles, how are those relationships established? It means a type of rethinking the politics and power dimensions. Governance research is about power, but there are also ways in which with COVID-19, we need to rethink the power dynamics in research, whether it's how Global North partnerships are set up with the Global South, but also how we think about what is research how do we co-produce knowledge with communities who have a different sense of what kind of evidence is valuable to inform local action? So in that sense, research on governance, not only is it examining politics, but research on governance is a political act in of itself. And we need to really invest in those who have a long track record and who are working in partnership with all these different stakeholders who are doing research in a consultative manner to build trust in evidence. Because if that is one thing that will carry us through in the sea of, as Deborah said, fake news and a lot of resistance, even if we have the vaccines and the medicines and the clinical, clinical knowledge, it's really how do we broker better effective societal responses and governance and social science um, research is critical there. Thank you. Thanks, Asher. Great summary of um, and report from the um, uh, governance 
group. What resonates with me is just rethinking the um, the power structure and, and imbalances that we work with and um, need to look at other ways of working from the ground up that values and privileges community voices and responses in, in research. I uh, might hand it over to George um, to uh, report on the methodologies um, group. Thanks, George. Mark uh, Max Bergman. The presentations were by Nawazi and uh, Kanazi, Wesley Schramm, David Bakarich, and Shizong Kalinga. So basically, the, uh, one could sum up um, if, you, if you're trying to find up a title, can we speak the same language? Would be a sort of a, a, a good a good idea. The idea was to how this was one of one of the the ideas was to walk, how incorporate social science into national uh, into natural sciences projects. The paradoxical view here is that you know at the, at the end of the day we have no vaccines, we have no uh, uh, treatment for, for COVID, so we are actually relying a lot on, on, on social and, and political administrative uh, questions. So at, at the end of the day, we actually uh, we cannot sell ourselves like ourselves shorts, you know. Uh, so the uh, Nawazi did a, a wonderful presentation on, you know, how care is absolutely uh, fundamental for uh, communities, you know, and and uh, and how does it, how is it changing and it not changing at the same time uh, with with COVID? Meaning, the gendered issues of care, meaning uh, women are still the ones that are the being the main carers, and these are intra-household decisions, which has, you know. Uh, it's not by any means random, so it's actually um, very important. Moreover, this is uh, this the setting is getting worse and worse due to the high em employment, you know. And we can generalize this to 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 an array of of settings. Um, it is also stress, extremely stressful, meaning you might be a caregiver, but you might also end up being a recipient. And so this is um, this is also a call for for funders to actually realize that um, that to have local community uh, data it is absolutely uh, important to kind of uh, uh, have the the tools to actually have the nitty gritty of the daily lives. And this is something that uh, Shizuma Kalinga also said, you know, this is uh, the, the, the amount of stigma, that the amount of anxieties, the, the, difference, the differentiation between a timeline within a natural science project and a timeline in a social science project. This is a, and the fact that this is not a, a this is a slow burn epidemic unlike what, what we might have thought in, uh, in uh, early, earlier on. So uh, this is, um, she also mentioned that the parody between the North funding and the, and the, and the South. Uh, I would say that it's absolutely, um, absolutely essential to have this, this daily, uh, the daily awareness of care and how this, is, how this can, can be a burden. It is absolutely central to grant visibility to the most vulnerable, to the, to the neglected actors, as someone said. It might be prisoners and inmates, might be disability population, might be drug users, homeless people. Uh, and this is absolutely central. Or might be uh, populations in, in living in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, shanty towns and urban areas, deprived urban areas in the global south. Um, David Buckridge and Wesley Schramm put up a, a different methodological views. David uh, was uh, his, his, uh, again wanting to see beyond the, this uh, uh, official discourse and seeing how things are actually going, how, how non-pharmaceutical actions are triggering a particular response and, and he's using um, and he's using uh, big big data and so it is interesting that he's also uh, um, finding that the, the terminology uh, surfacing is interesting the temporality and the change change is a concept here and it's absolutely very very uh, tangible and it, it surfaces in, in all present presentation it surfaces in all um, 
in, in, in all uh, discussions. And uh, Wesley is also uh, um, or noting that uh, uh, through a survey, although he did say that, you know, a survey finding the fine and dandy, but that we need to actually uh, go into the field. Uh, you cannot, although it's difficult to jump into the field currently, but it's it is absolutely uh, central to to find the, the the details and to actually have people to expand a little bit on, on what what they actually um, uh, what they actually experience with uh, with uh, with COVID or living in a, in a COVID environment. The interesting thing here is that um, all of them. <laughs> When, when, when Max asked him, so I'll, I'll give you three wishes and all of that, not, not money, not time, what you want. And they all said more dialogue overall. You know, it's a more dialogue, feedback from the WHO, connection to the WHO, more dialogue with the, with the public health personnel or a way, a different ways to talk to the, to, to, to the, to the people, to the, to, to the population. So what we actually uh, might have, might have uh, think is that um, um, some critics were saying that uh, attention when when social science get on board national uh, uh, national uh, natural science projects for the simple reason that sometimes you know um, it is not an equal partnership. So they can other times is that okay we can actually a natural science can actually say we can also do quantitative analysis. You know, it's it's not a big deal. So. The idea is we go in, we go together, but we go on equal foot, equal footing. On my personal note, uh, and if I may, just uh, I think that it will be most interesting to kind of, uh, um, and this is maybe a little bit too much, uh, give a, uh, uh, in terms of training biomedical scientists, but also uh, reshape social scientists in, in a way that we can actually uh, find common grounds to dialogue. Maybe, be it uh, in the in the public health arena, as as, uh, as some, someone uh, put it, but the idea is it is a complex world, and it's not a one size fits all program, and the the, the perspective must be long term, as as we've learned with the, with Ebola, as we've learned with Zika, this does not end when the uh, when the, the the pandemic ends, stigmatization ends, and all the problems. They all keep on on, on existing. Thanks, George. Um, I really enjoyed um, the reports, and I look forward to reading everyone's notes. Um, so we'll collect those off everyone later. But uh, just some uh, very lot of similarities across all the the, the four themes in the groups. Um, some of them are coming through is that we need to empower community and fostering. Um, partnerships and relationships with um, communities to enable uh, voices to be heard, but then also acknowledging that Western medical approaches to addressing health and especially with COVID fails to recognise or value other worldviews and we need different approaches to, to tackle the issue. Um, so thanks again for um, all the rapporteurs and, and your reports back. Um, I'll head it, hand it over to Kenneth now. Um, we'll lead the um, the questions um, and answer session. Okay, then, um, as, as we wait for the questions to arrive, uh, I would like to propose for the, our rapporteurs um, that um, um, one of the, the key issue actually for this meeting is the issue of uh, synergies and corporations. And if you can devise ways uh, right now uh, within your groups and with re relation to the other groups of what kind of interaction that could be expected from the different researchers that you've appointed. Um, would like to go first. Uh, Bial. Hi, yeah. You mean synergy among the researchers? How can we form larger research agendas among, them, among ourselves? Is this yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think there are many, as we heard, I mean, all these are four uh, themes, right? The governance, uh, communication, and the population, and of course, finally, methods. Especially, I think all of us have mentioned the method. So therefore, one theme that the funding agencies can consider and the way as researchers also can consider, you know, 
form a forum or somehow in the coming years, either for social scientists to come together to think in the social sciences for the 21st century or social scientists, social sciences for uh, the post COVID world. Uh, so somehow I feel what I'm missing is the economics. I don't know why, because now the concern about the livelihood of economic recovery is really you know, on top of the head of all this government. And as I mentioned, now you have a very clear strategy of, for rapid recovery to, the, to what we had before. And we have you know, repeatedly emphasized what we had before coronavirus is a problem. It's not the people we want to return to. But what does government want to do is to jump back to form. So therefore, probably we need to bring in um, a serious uh, political economist not to do this technical uh, number crunching. Uh, economists then think of the, 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 uh, the recovery uh, uh, strategy. I think this is the one, the second theme that we can uh, uh, based on which we can build a common topic for, for conversation. Yeah, so, and then, of course, the third theme, if I just not make up, don't make up, just think along the way, based on what I heard. The third theme is, what I'm quite interested in, is kind of this new notion emerging during this, I mean, uh, in last weeks, between uh, my colleagues and me, is the idea about the, the hyper-local reaction. You somehow, you know, if it's very difficult to really design a national decision making mechanisms where all these local concerns can be uh, taken into consideration because the shape of a locality is so different in every place. So therefore the idea of hyper locality is that you have some NGOs or groups who are deeply embedded in a particular place or more often within a particular group of people. Uh, the group of people may be uh, scattered around. So they know the situation inside out. So they will give us timely update and feedback about their situation. This kind of hyper local approach, I guess the idea is that we also need to rethink the idea of community. What the community is like today is probably different from what the community was like before. So that's kind of a local, what local means in the post-COVID uh, post world, right, as a basis of decision making. Anyway, so reshape social sciences for 21st century and uh, uh, recovery strategy, hyper-local community engagement, probably three things. Thank you, uh, Deborah. Would you like to, to add something, please? Um, yeah. So like I've already said, um, our panelists focused on very specific uh, questions around like the challenges that they're facing and, um, you know, like the, the kind of, um, the, the, the kind of um, input that, that they would want to give to, to funders as they continue to fund our um, research on COVID. So if I was going to highlight some of the key issues that came up from the panelists, I would say that most of them highlighted that most funders want quick social science research to be done around COVID, but there are obviously challenges to conduct uh, social science research using in-depth interviews and focus group discussions where there's a requirement to maintain um, physical distance and uh, two most important issues that were stressed as well were the things that have been highlighted before issues around empowering communities involving them in the in the ways that uh, communication messages are framed as well as in the research as well as um, conducting interdisciplinary research. So that's what I would add. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Asha?
Yes, I uh, just want to echo some of the comments that are made and also we have a very active chat group. I think there is a call, obviously, to, I think, Bao, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, said it nicely. We have many multifaceted needs and therefore bringing in other disciplines. But what came out very strongly from our panel is who, how do we change the models of research so that we really um, bring in um, other stakeholders, community, a number of people mentioned community, but there might be other, t uh, in addition, how do we think about community, but community members, um, managers, health workers, um, how do we do research in a consultative, inclusive way so that it's part of building these relationships um, to strengthen resilience as a society to respond to COVID-19 because of its complexity, because one solution doesn't fit all, and therefore that inclusion and that voice of, of um, the diversity of society is key because also the pressures are geared to a very top-down response. You need effective, fast responses, but you can't leave out whole sectors of society. So we need to rethink what, what is research in this context? What is valuable data? How is it meaningful for local actors? And how do we strengthen um, the existing relationships and platforms to response? Particularly because many of our marginalized communities are on uh, on the margins of existence. They are in dire uh, poverty. And therefore, there are questions of the ethics of research, of how we conduct research is so important as well. Over. OK, we already have a few questions, but I'd like to hand over to Jorge to, re to do his comments and then address the um, uh, questions that are being asked. Uh, Jorge, would like to comment, please? I'll follow the, the mantra going going around. Basically, the the need to, to rethink research and absolutely value uh, or, or find ways to, to add value to social science data. Being you know being extremely ex explicit to what we actually uh, to what we actually can uh, can can do. What products can we deliver? Which was one of the sentences. But uh, but it's also and, and this you can you, you can actually. Uh, from my experience, in terms of uh, very strong interdisciplinary research, is something really interesting. As I said, integratively and with dialogue, it's also be it will also be much much more interesting to actually have a sort of a, a processual view, a view of the process of, of of the epidemic itself, rather than and just little snips and and and, uh, and little. Um, uh, little action, the application of, of government uh, uh, policies and then we say yes or, 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 or no. The idea was to probably, um, again, go and see the, the, the initial uh, zoonosis from the initial the arrival of the virus, the pandemic, the first, the second wave, the post. And all this, of course, uh, not doing it alone, but doing it in, in a, in a consulting ways, in ways to that, that you actually bring forward those who are probably most likely to be affected. Those neglected actors, those the, those public, the, the public that are most, most, most vulnerable. Most, uh, vulnerable. And so I, I think that's basically I think we are on the same page. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have already some comments. I would like to, the, the first remark from uh, HYL, uh, I think it's very relevant about uh, how we could, uh, the, the whole issue about the data hierarchies. Uh, and someone else commented about that, how um, uh, qu quantitative data and data that comes from epidemiological studies is regarded as more scientific than the, the, the social science information, the qualitative information. And that also applies to the funders and, and how funding is distributed. So uh, I wonder if someone would like to comment on that. I think it's a very important point and something that we will br certainly bring to, to the general discussion on Thursday. Anyone would like to comment? 
Sabina? Yeah, hi. So now I was going to say what I find, uh, whether it's, co I mean, COVID is a particular time where there's a lot of stress and um, anxiety and only certain voices are represented in public health or in development. But what I find living and working here for a long time is that there's often a competition or a lack of coordination amongst development partners in terms of priorities. So working in informal settlements, you'll see a lot of communication, a lack of coordination, uh, a lot of replication. Uh, secondly, I think, um, particularly in public health, there is a predominance of uh, very much surveys and prevalence and qualitative is sort of seen as sort of anecdotal additions. And I think for development partners, they really need to pay attention to how they are also reproducing certain kinds of ecosystems where uh, qualitative or social science or anthropology and other disciplines can in fact really give you valuable insights on how we engage communities effectively, how we have sustainable development programs. But the reality is that it is sort of biased and geared towards clinical or prevalence or surveys, which in the long term, I think, is short-sighted because communities are not engaged. And while surveys and prevalence and all of that is, of course, critically important to understand, but we need to understand contextual realities for planning sustainability, for planning interventions, we're looking at communication approaches if we're trying to improve lives, health and, and well-being and economic and social. So I think a most socially just model needs to be used by um, the research kind of community looking at catastrophes like the COVID on the most marginalized, but also development partners and funders need to also crit uh, reflect critically on how they prioritize and, and, and dominate a particular discourse out there that marginalizes from research voices to uh, active engagement in various ways. I think that's a really important point that you've made, Sabina, around um, prioritising different groups and, and having a voice in, um, in how research is conducted. Um, a question that I had was, um, that came through was, how do we develop a global research agenda that is reflective of local needs of the global south rather than funders that come from the north? Can I also add something since we're talking about this, uh, yep. Sabina? Again. I just find also the priorities and the priority setting has to move beyond. We have a couple of people from developed countries sitting on platforms and and meetings. I think there needs to be real reflection about how do you engage with different contexts, different countries' needs, and how do we then prioritize that? Because you m might need to not just. It's not about scaling up. It's about trying to understand these contextual realities and priorities that could be quite diverse and critical to addressing uh, not only pandemic, but health and development issues. And I think there needs to be that push by, um, you know, rich, very resourced countries or funders uh, to look at these sorts of, um, I don't know, guidelines or approaches, you know, um, suddenly there, there will be a funding that's available, suddenly there won't be, and when priorities and, and themes and shifts change, I know it's political, I know it's linked to many other issues, but at least there needs to be some honest reflection on how that, you know, what's useful about some of the approaches and existing approaches, but what is also problematic and challenging. Hi, uh, can I, this is the PR, can I uh, chip in or is that a cue there or? Hello? Go ahead, Biao. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, just uh, in response to the previous two questions, I don't have a clear answer, but this is something I have been thinking. So we are starting a, I call the small data inventory at the Max Planck Institute. I mean, it will be made available probably next year. I mean, this is a response to big data because now we're so dominated by big data thinking and all this uh, quantitative way of looking at the world. Uh, so the idea of a small data inventory is to collect qualitative information, especially ethnographic uh, cases across the world, and then we put it together to see whether or not a certain theme will emerge. I think my point here is that we do need to think very carefully what should be the form of output 
of qualitative social research. Uh, I mean, that is a reality that there is a data hierarchy, namely quantitative one is taken more seriously than the qualitative one. But for the people on the qualitative side, we also need to think carefully how we can uh, uh, produce the type of knowledge which will make an impact. Because of what we are doing now, actually, in terms of the form of output, is very similar to what quantitative, quantitative researchers have been doing. You know, it's a whole report and a very dry language, you try to be uh, technical and speaking to policymakers, uh, funding agencies, rather than, rather than talking to the people on the street directly. Because the people on the street, they wanted to hear some qualitative stories, right? I mean, uh, that is something we, we, yeah, I really hope some uh, funding agencies will be interested in uh, this effort, the small data stories, how we can have a, a, a cultivate a big voice from small data. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what, what I want to say is that a call for quite a cri critical and as well as innovative reflection on what kind of research we should deliver in the end. Yeah. Okay, we have a number of people try, try to talk. Uh, Nina has asked to speak first. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to try and find my camera. Hi. So I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for these discussions. They've been uh, un unbelievably sort of rich and, and dynamic and exciting. And it's particularly uh, interesting to sort of, I think, have the discussions rather than, you know, just have the presentations. I'm reading in the, um, uh, in the chat lots of sort of people putting forward ideas around platforms and uh, and questions around sort of how we stay connected post event uh, and also sort of there seems to be quite a lot of, of potential for uh, collaborating or thinking about sort of how we draw on the expertise from some of the different members of the, of, in the group. Um, and I did just want to highlight the, the COVID-19 research roadmap mechanism that was initially funded um, and set up in, uh, in the February meeting uh, with WHO in Geneva. Um, as a potential option. There's certainly a number of discussions that are happening uh, here that sort of resonate with some pieces of work that are going forward. Uh, and of course, there's a number of other initiatives and other groups that are also sort of taking pieces of work forward. So very exciting and, and just wanted to, uh, you know, make that, make that pitch for, for connection beyond the meeting. Thanks. Thank you. We have now, uh... Susan and then Othvin. Susan, please. Hi, thank you so much. It's been uh, just absolutely wonderful listening to everyone, both the sessions and the questions has been really um, so helpful and productive. And I just wanted to amplify um, what was just said. Uh, this project um, at Max Planck sounds really fascinating. And just in terms of funding, um, increasingly we see students in anthropology and my colleagues, including myself, our qualitative work, because we um, survive in terms of researchers uh, on funding, our, our projects and our questions and the framing and the proposals look more and more like quantitative research. So the, the distinct, this distinct um, kind of profound um, nature of, of qualitative research um, has really given way to something else and that's due to the ways in which it's it's sidelined by often by funders, um, and especially in relationship to public health discourse, um, epidemiology, when it comes to illness, the sidelining of medical anthropology forces or, or critical health humanities forces some of us to look more like qualitative. So I just wanted to really make that point and direct um, anyone who's interested to a really exciting body of literature called post qualitative analysis, which is, is um, you know, bringing back other modes of thinking around illness through life histories and other forms of narrative work and um, working together across disciplines and bringing to the table different expertises will, will really help to bring out these local uh, stories as, as, as Josephine has said around marginalized populations, but also uh, people who are working on the margins of academia often in, in terms of um, uh, medical fields. So yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Ortwin? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, my basic idea was that we should, I think, not 
focus so much on the division between qualitative and quantitative research. I think both are very necessary and both depend on the target to which we apply them. I think what is really needed, and I think that was echoed several times also in the groups that we had been discussing about communication, is that we have to look more clearly into implementation or what we can may call implementation or even transdisciplinary science. That is a science that looks into how can we make the insights from science more operational to those to whom we serve the science. And that, I think, is an important element. It's not just that we collect data from others or knowledge from others, but also to really focus the knowledge that we have on the policies, on the structures, on the communication, and on the action of those for whom this knowledge is important. And I think that's a very strong element in terms also in funding agencies. Very often, funding agencies even look into more analysis of phenomena or more analysis of including different types of knowledge, which I think is okay, but how to really redirect knowledge into a way that it is really effective for the kind of purposes that we would like to serve, like for more health or for more well-being or whatever it is. I think uh, so in line of some normative virtues and goals that we would like to accomplish and to see what kind of knowledge is necessary and how we need to design that kind of knowledge. I think that is a very important element that is very often neglected. And I think in the crisis right now, it's very crucial to have that kind of knowledge, that kind of understanding of the nexus between science, decision makers and affected publics. Uh, thank you, Otman. Uh, we have now Houghton. Yes, uh, this is Andreas Hoel for research infrastructures from the European Commission, um, the Horizon 2020 program. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to point that was this, um, mentioning before that uh, there's a lack of a global research agenda there and uh, that is largely set by northern funders and uh, I think there are some examples where that has been done different. So in the, we did this European and developing cl uh, countries clinical trials partnership that was in malaria, TB and HIV and for vaccines and for uh, therapies. But I think uh, this sort of uh, enterprise where you get uh, north and south together in some sort of partnership approach is has to be triggered by um, a funders forum like this hero forum that also triggered GLOPIT R and I think uh, one has to hook up the social sciences a bit onto the the, uh, the health research agenda especially in this COVID context and I think then there is um, there is pathway sort of to come to fora there partnership fora where something like a global research agenda that is not dominated by northern funders alone uh, can be sort of designed many things. Uh, thank you. We still have like four minutes. Uh, is there anyone who would like to make an intervention? Uh, Leanne? Thanks. I actually put my, heart, my hand down when you said we had four minutes. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> then you, but then you asked for an intervention, so you know. <laughs> right, so four minutes for the intervention, yeah. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is, I mean, there's now so much evidence um, globally about the dominance of northern based researchers and it really just is unacceptable to continue in this way and so i guess there's the role of the funders to support collaborative work across contexts and then there's the work we all have to do i mean i'm, I'm south african based here and so we're kind of i guess some would argue that we're, we're somewhere in the middle but i think it's 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 sometimes those binaries are false ones but it's certainly the onus is on all of us to shift the way we do research and then i just wanted to pick up on two other points uh, the one about the kind of the quantitative qualitative distinction being an unhelpful one, I would agree. I think really it's 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 the work we we answer the particular questions and draw on whichever research methodologies support the answering of those questions in the best possible way, recognizing that they need to be rooted in on the ground experiences of the challenges of people in very particular areas. So. Oh, I really love the idea of small data. I think a lot of people are saying the next big thing is going to be lots and lots of small things. And I guess, it, yeah, this current pandemic pushes all of us to think of the lessons that we're learning and what is being revealed in this moment, you know? And I think like, um, I've certainly really valued a lot of Arundhati Roy's work in this regard, 
talking about how you know another world is not only possible but she's on her way and on a quiet day i can hear her breathing and i think these kinds of ways of thinking about the post covid world are extremely relevant to the kinds of work that we do and the health systems and development responses we seek to support through the different forms of, of research. Um, and I guess the message to funders would be not to just fund research projects, but to fund more complex interventions that are rooted in embedded research processes that work collaboratively with decision makers, policy makers and implementers connected and centering community responses. So that would be my input. Thank you. Um, okay, well, we're more or less at the end of this Q&A session. Um, I'd like just to point out a few. Um, I, I won't dare to summarize the very rich discussions that we have, just highlight some points that I think are very important that came out. Uh, first of all, um, that was the last item in my list, but I think I should start with it, is, is the whole issue of how we advocate for a, a, a more a weight for social sciences approaches in research and, and the design of policies in general. I think this is a challenge for all of us uh, and we have to address that for the funders and also to um, political uh, entities and, and even the population in general, the very important role that this kind of research has uh, in uh, understanding what's going on and designing uh, proper uh, responses. Uh, one of the things that uh, comes from that is the need to establish those uh, research networks and to have uh, the to, to really have interdisciplinary research. I think that the, the, the very important thing that they should be designed from the ground up. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, social science shouldn't be an afterthought that the, from the planning phase and, and everything. Uh, this kind of uh, thinking should be integrated because this will also have repercussions in terms of data analysis and the, the kind of production that we have. I think that uh, Otvin made a very important point about uh, data triangulation. Uh, in, in terms of specific issues that we have to look at, I think that Bial raised an issue that is very, I have thought a lot and, and I, I think it's a, a very, has a very important dimension uh, in this particular pandemic, but in general, is the issue of economics and, and political economy in general. Uh, this is something that should be uh, really thought of because many of the problems that we're looking at comes from economic inequality and how to deal with it. Uh, issues of uh, stigma and prejudice that are always re resurfacing that we should uh, try to address. Uh, how to value and in integrate local expertises in, in general uh, uh, issues. And, and we have had very important um, local responses to uh, the challenge of, of, of uh, promoting social distancing. Um, uh, the whole issue of having platforms to share knowledge and information and how we uh, avoid uh, replication and waste of resources uh, in terms of different uh, research agendas. Um, and then I think the very important point is a general political issue of power relationships. And I think ethics, as Asha has uh, written, also plays into this. Um, the whole issue of North-South and the relationship between funders and researchers and the populations, how we have uh, the social society, the civil society uh, present also in the designing uh, of, of research protocols and defining what are the priorities. Uh, one thing that I fear that we, if we have a, a too much closing up, I think I can understand what was said about the divisions uh, that, that sometimes we have overlap and, 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 and a sort of ways of reproduction of different uh, funders for, different, for the same research doing, being done by different agencies. But on the other hand, if you try to centralize too much that, I fear uh, the kind of power that the funders will have in terms of setting agendas. And this is something, this balance is something that we should be concerned all the time. Uh, those are the general ideas that I have. I would like to once again thank everyone for the very, very interesting presentations and the very rich discussion. And I would like to hand it over to my co-chair, Chrissy. Um, your thoughts, please. Kenneth, you've gave, given a very good uh, summary of, of, of the discussion and lots of great questions coming through. So I wonder if we can um, save uh, the questions and the comments from the chat um, and we can go through at another time. But I'd like to um, thank everyone for coming and um, I, you know, 
really enjoyed um, the presentations um, that I sat in on and um, certainly the, the discussion that was really engaging way um, of, of getting some good, um, good chats happening and some really good ideas and questions around moving forward and um, you know, social sciences play a huge part in developing, understanding, exploring experiences, especially during um, the COVID pandemic. And it's even more important to plan a way forward so we can avoid some of the challenge that we are seeing and that we have seen in past pandemics. Um, but I think um, from, you know, the conversations that we've had today, um, what's really needed is, um, you know, the platforms for social sciences researchers to work collaboratively together. So um, I hope that there's something um, that follows on from this where we can keep the conversation going. Um, but thank you again. And I'd like to thank our team um, and, and the organisers for, um, for making this work um, <laughs> without any glitches that I don't know of anyway, but um, the technology seemed to go smoothly. So um, thank you again. Kenneth, maybe we can give the word to Charu now. Yes, that, that's the, what I was going to say. <laughs> Charu, please. Would like uh, so, to... uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, thanks to all the participants. Uh, you know, this is the most determined team of participants because you've had people hang out to the end uh, of the session. So thanks very much again, very engaging. And thank you to the co-chairs, uh, Kenneth and Christy. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Yazdin to uh, close out the session for us. Yazdin, are you there? If not, then uh, maybe we can uh, switch to the next slide. I know Yazdin had uh, some urgent calls to attend to. Uh, so yeah, so uh, thanking everybody for an uh, excellent session. I think we'll see some of the summaries that will come out from all the four parallel sessions. Uh, uh, excellent discussions. Uh, I couldn't agree more uh, that, you know, social sciences have really, really played out an important role in this pandemic. And it's clear that this needs to be part of the overall strategy. Uh, and Glopidar is very glad to bring social sciences to the center and forefront to emphasize uh, uh, you know, that at the end of the day, whatever strategies that biomedical sciences may create, uh, it's all about social sciences in terms of uptake and acceptance and communication. Uh, so thanks to everybody who's participated in this meeting. Thanks to the co-chairs. A big shout out and thank you to Joao and Morgan for laying this program out uh, in collaboration with the co-chairs. Uh, probably the most complex, but uh, Thankfully, the technology works, so no glitches as far as I could see. Uh, and I would like to invite everybody back to session five, uh, which is on Thursday, which is the summary from all the four sessions that we've had on vaccine, therapeutics, transmission, and social sciences. Uh, the chairs for all the sessions will provide the summaries and uh, we will have a great panel discussion where WHO, CEPI, and some of the international opinion leaders will be participating. Uh, and I see Yazdin's back on the, on the screen. So Yazdin, final word to you. Thank you, Charu. Uh, so no, I think that Charu said everything. Great thanks uh, uh, to everyone, to the speakers, uh, to the panelists, to uh, all those who participate and uh, special thanks to the organizers uh, as usual for having done a huge amount uh, of work uh, thanks uh, a lot and thanks also to Charu for the for the for the all the input and as Charu said I think the session five which is on Thursday uh, will be I think interesting for everyone to come back and, and to have an overview we have always tried to make this uh, research priorities transdisciplinary and it's not always easy to do transdisciplinary but I really believe in that so I think that it's important to have that session set up to try to have a better overview of all this so thanks to everyone. Charu back to you. Thanks very much and hopefully see you all on Thursday have a great day great evening great night thanks.
Thank you, everybody. Bye.